All right. So today we are looking at two way. Well, we're looking at using tables um, to represent the sample space of two step experiments. So we've got a couple of learning intentions today. Um, the first one is to understand the difference between with replacement and without replacement and the impact this might have on the possible outcomes of a two step experiment. So we want to really understand the difference between replacing and not replacing. Um, we'll see that soon. And then um, once we're able to understand the possible outcomes, then we're going to be able to calculate probabilities based on the sample space that we create with our table. All right. So firstly, we're looking at two-step experiments using tables. So what are two-step experiments? Um, so, so far we've been looking at one step experiments. So that could be like rolling a die, flipping a coin, um, choosing one card from a deck of cards. Today we're looking at um, experiments with two steps. So um, this time there's two parts to the experiment. So this could be um, flipping a coin twice. This could be taking one card from a deck of cards and then taking another card from a deck of cards. Or maybe it's um, rolling two die, like two dice, like you do in um, many board games such as Monopoly. Um, so what we're going to be looking at today um, those two step experiments. Of course, you can have experiments with more steps, um, but we're focusing on two steps today. Um, so firstly, let's focus on we got that learning intention about with replacement and without replacement. So now let's focus on what I mean by with replacement. So say we've got an example here. I've got a lovely picture there. We've got a marble being taken from a bag. You write down the color that you get. You put the marble back in the bag, draw another one and note the color. So what we're doing is we're putting the marble back and then we're noting the next one. So that's with replacement. So you can see here, this is what our outcomes would look like. We've got our first draw here. So this is where we note um, these are our options for the first draw. You could get red, blue or green on the first draw. And then in our vertical, we've got the second draw. And again, our options of red, blue and green. And now, you know, in our sample space, this represents... This part here is representing what happens if you get a red one, you've put it back and then you've drawn a red one again. Um, this part here is representing you've got a blue marble on your first draw and a red marble on your second draw. So this table just helps us be systematic and keep track of all our possible outcomes without missing any. So when you put it back, that's with replacement. Now let's look at another example here. This is what I mean when I'm talking about without replacement. So this time you take a marble from a bag, you write down what colour you get and then you get another marble. Now this time you don't put the first marble back in. So when we fill in our table, our first draw here, red, blue, green and our second draw, red, blue, green, we can straight away do a big cross in these parts here because in this one it's not possible to get um, it's not possible to get two reds. Once we take out this red one, then our only options for the second draw is a green and a blue. So if we're without replacement, we can do a big cross through all the double ups and then fill in the rest of our sample space. So notice this time we've only got six possible outcomes. Back before, when we were putting it back, there was nine. So that's the difference between with replacement and without replacement. So let's um, have a look at some examples of the kind of questions you'll be working on here. Um, I'll get open up my whiteboard, just a bit easier to do it on the whiteboard. So say we've got a six-sided um, six-sided die and we've got to state the total number of outcomes. So let's use a two-way table here to state our possible outcomes. So um, it could be good to like keep track of what all the different things are. So I'm going to go one, two, 
three, four, five, six. And this represents the first, first roll. And then we can also get one, two, three, four, five, six. So now let's fill in our options. We've got our first roll across here and then we've got our second roll along the vertical. So we can get, so this one represents um, just filling all our options. So I'm filling in the column now of what happens when you get a one on the first roll. Feel free to skip ahead and fill this in on your own and see if we get the same. All right, we got there. So now here's our table of all the possible outcomes. And now let us state the total number of outcomes. So we could either go through and count them all, or because we've got a table, bit of a shortcut, we've got six by six, six options on the first roll, six options on the second roll. So it's going to be um, 36, 36 different outcomes. Um, the probability of obtaining the outcome, two and then one. So let's have a look, getting a two and then one. Let's check our sample space. There is one option here. That is a two and then a one. So probability of getting two and then one. There's one option, so that's our numerator. Out of our total, 36. Now, of course, this would be different if it was asked, if it didn't matter about the order. If it was the probability of getting a 2 and a 1, then there'd be 2 out of 36 here. Now let's keep on moving along. So now we've got um, probability of the sum of 5. Now there's going to be a few different options in our sample space here that have a sum of 5. So let's go searching for them. So sum of 5. So that's a sum of two, one and one. Sum of three. These ones here are a sum of four, four and one. 
that's a sum of five, three and two, that's a sum and five, two and three, sum of five, one and four, sum of five. And that's all. So our probability of getting the sum of five equals four options. Sum means add up, so like four plus one is five. So once there's four options out of 36, and then of course, let's simplify that fraction. Highest common factor here is four, one ninth. Probability of the sum of at least 11. So now we're talking about at least 11. So we're going to include ones that have a sum of 12 and those that outcomes that have a sum of 11. So this one, 6 and 6, that's a 12. And then we got 6 and 5 and 5 of 6, they're both 11. The next one's a 10. So the probability of getting at least 11, there are three outcomes out of 36, but we've got to simplify our fraction. Highest common factor of three, so one out of 12. Finally, find the probability of a sum of two given that the sum is at most five. Oh, given, given. Excellent. I'm hoping you guys see that word given and you automatically think of conditional probability. So the probability of the sum of two, given that the sum is at most five. So now it's not going to be out of 36 anymore. Now we're only interested in the ones that are at most five. So we've got this diagonal row here that we highlighted in pink earlier. So our denominator is going to be like just out of that top corner there. So we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So the denominator, the denominator is ten. Probability of the sum of two. So now how many out of this little section have a um, have a sum of two? Let's have a look. There's one. So it's going to be one out of ten. And you might like to write that as a decimal because tenths work really nicely as a decimal 0 0.1. Either or. Of course, you can also think about that using our intersections and that kind of thing. But I really like to think of given as, um, as just narrowing the possibilities. But yeah, interested, you could have shown your working out in a different way. And I'd love to see it if you did it a different way. All right. Next example, now of course with rolling a die, you can, it, it's like with replacement because um, if you roll a six on the first roll, it doesn't impact your probability of rolling a six on the second roll. This other example is a little bit different. Let's have a look. So this time what we've got is we've got a letter chosen from the word happy. So imagine all these letters on a piece of paper in a hat. Um, you pull out two letters. So you pull out one, then you pull out another one. So you don't put it back. So this time it's without replacement. It's impossible to get the same letter twice. So let's draw up our table. Um, so I like, it's good to break up for me like your first pick and then your second pick. So let's start with H. Actually, I might leave myself a bit more room. Let's go with H, A, P, P, Y. We'll call 
is the first pick and then we will go H A P P Y and then the second pick. All right, so now we've got our table set up, let's fill in our possible sample space. So to start off this time, we know that once you draw out a letter, you can't get it again. So we're gonna start by doing little crosses through on the diagonal here. So this is showing that if you pick the H on the first one, it's obviously impossible to pick it on the second one because it's already out. And so on. So when you don't have replacement, you can start by doing those little crosses. Now let's fill in the rest of our table. So if we get an H on our first pick, then our options are HA, HP, HP. There's two options of getting an HP because there's two different P's in there. All right, so now I've got my sample space, all my options are here. Now, let's find the probability of getting an H and then a P. So for this one, let's have a look in my sample space. How many options are there that are an H and then a P? There's two. I've got my two options. So we got this one and this one. So I got two out of, and then we count how many we've got in total. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20. Two out of 20. And then simplify the fraction, common factor of two. So one, one tenth or of course one tenth. Now let's look at the probability of selecting two P's. So let's again have a look in our sample space. Where do we see two P's? So there's two P's here and two P's here. So the probability of getting two P's, there is two out of our total number of possible outcomes, 20, one-tenth or one-tenth. Okay, what is now the probability of selecting a P and a Y? So we're after a P and a Y. So let's count how many of these we see in our sample space. Here's a P and a Y. Here's a P and a Y. Here's a Y and a P, but we don't care about order. We just want to know getting a P and a Y. So this time there are four out of 20 or 
one fifth, the common factor of four, or two tenths. Now we've got another juicy question, some nice conditional probability. I'm seeing that word given. The probability of selecting two P's given that at least one P is selected. Okay, so now we're not out of 20 anymore. We're only out of one P being selected. So let's count up in our sample space how many times we got one P being selected. So we got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. All right, so now we know our denominator is 14. Now, out of that 14, what is the probability of getting two Ps? two P's, so we've got one, two. So it's two out of 14, which is one seventh. Now I suppose it's interesting. So if we know that one P is selected, now that's, um, it's a bit more likely than getting two Ps than out of the total. So what, only if we know that one P is selected, it increases our chance of getting two Ps. All right, that's it from me. Um, we'll go through the review in class together. Um, see you soon.